If you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. For those of you who don't know, we've taken a break from the book of Genesis. We were in chapter 7 of Genesis. I'm finishing up the book of Ephesians. We're going to finish up the book I've calculated based on the messages that I'm doing through Ephesians. We're going to be finishing up right before VBS in June. And then after the 4th of July, we're going to launch back into the book of Genesis. But for tonight, We want to look at chapter 5, verses 15 through 17. And remember, the theme of chapters 4 through 6 of the book of Ephesians is walk worthy. Paul mentions this in verse 1 of chapter 4, and he tells the Ephesians that they are to walk worthy. They're to walk in a manner worthy of the calling that they have received. The calling is chapters 1 through 3, and then chapters 4 through 6, he chronicles for us what that worthy walk looks like. And I've given you several ways that you and I can walk worthy. The first way is we are to walk in unity. In other words, when you and I seek to resolve conflict, when we seek to live in harmony with other people, you know what we're doing as Christians? We're walking worthy. Secondly, he says we're to walk in service. He says that when you and I serve other people with the gifts that God has given us, we are walking worthy. Thirdly, he says we're to walk in separation in verses 17 through 32. And when you and I live differently than the culture, not that we're weird, not that we're odd, but when there's a qualitative distinctiveness about our life as Christians compared to the world, and we don't live like the pagan, you and I are walking worthy. And then last week, we looked at the fourth way that we could walk worthy, this is where we get into chapter five, and that is we're to walk in love. And Paul defined what that love is. It's a sacrificial love. It's an agape love. It's the love of choice, love of will. It's choosing to love other people, expecting nothing in return. It's an unselfish love. And so when you and I love people, we are walking worthy. And then finally, we looked at last week, if you and I are going to walk worthy, we are to walk in the light. And remember I said light represents truth, and it also represents holiness. And so when we walk in holiness, when we're dealing with sin in our life, we're not going to be perfect. When we walk according to the truth of God's Word, you and I are walking in the light. Now for this morning, I mean this evening, we want to look at the next way that you and I can walk worthy, and that is we are to walk in wisdom. We are to walk in wisdom. Notice what he says in verse 15 here. He says, therefore, be careful how you walk, there's that word again, our daily conduct, not as unwise men or women, but as what? Say it out loud, wise. The next thing he says, if you and I are going to walk worthy and we're going to honor God, is we need to walk in a lifestyle of wisdom. Now, the question that naturally arises is, what is wisdom? Well, you have to understand that the Greeks viewed wisdom more as a philosophical thing. Wisdom was more of a theoretical thing to the Greeks. In fact, if you read 1 Corinthians 1, Paul says that the Greeks love wisdom, Sophia. It's the pursuit of theoretical, philosophical knowledge. It's out there. It's debating ideas. That's different than how the Hebrews viewed wisdom. To the Jewish person, wisdom was being skilled at godly living. In fact, the word is used in secular meaning to refer to someone who is skilled at a particular craft. For example, years ago, my wife likes bears. And there was this guy in New Jersey that made bears. I saw him one day while I was driving, and I decided to pull over to his house. He was a big lumberjack guy. And he had this chainsaw, and he began to carve these types of bears. And it was a craft, it was a skill, because he had all this knowledge, and he was able to apply that knowledge, and he was able to craft something like this. In fact, I asked him, how did you learn this? He said, I learned it on YouTube. He says, I went to YouTube, and I watched somebody do it, and then he said, I took that information, and I applied it. And so, wisdom is applied knowledge. You know, if you go to medical school, if you're studying to be a surgeon, you have to do your four years of medical school, and then you have to do your residency. 
And what they do is they don't throw you in right away to operate on someone who's living. Why? Because they understand you have to develop the skill and you have to apply the knowledge of surgery that you've learned in a classroom. And so what they do is they operate on cadavers. You see, that's wisdom. Wisdom in the biblical realm to the Hebrew person was not so much information, although it included information, it was how you lived your life. And so, just as you're skilled at a craft, wisdom to the Jew was being skilled at godly living. It's being skilled on taking the principles of the Bible and applying it to your finances, applying it to your marriage, applying it to raising children, applying it in terms of dealing with temptation, applying it in terms of serving other people, applying it in terms of your relationships to other people. Now, to show you an example of this, in James chapter 3, verse 13, James, as you know, was writing to Jewish people, and notice here how he defines wisdom. It's consistent with what I just said on being skilled at godly living. He said, who among you is wise and understanding? That word understanding is sort of a synonym for wisdom, and notice how he defines wisdom and understanding like the Proverbs does. He says, let him show it by his good behavior, his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. James says, if you Jewish people claim to be wise, you need to demonstrate it by how you live, not by what you say. You could come to church and say, amen, preacher, preach it. But here's the bottom line. Are you giving feet to your amens? And then he goes into the specifics here of wisdom. But if you harbor, verse 14, bitter envy, and this was going on in the church, there was a lot of relational conflict. He says, if you harbor bitter envy, selfish ambition in your heart, don't boast about it or deny the truth. He says, such wisdom, verse 15, does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. Notice there is godly wisdom, and here there is earthly, demonic wisdom. And then in verse 16, he says, for where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven, notice God's wisdom, he says is pure. Are you living a pure life? Are you peace-loving? Are you considerate? Are you reasonable? Are you submissive? Are you full of mercy? Are you producing good fruit? Are you impartial and are you sincere? Verse 18, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. And so what James is saying is that wisdom to the Jew was being skilled at how you lived. It's not so much knowledge and information as much as it is applied knowledge. To the Greeks, it was more philosophical. It was more theoretical. To the Jewish person, it is how you live. Now, you have to understand, initially, when you and I become a Christian, we acquire God's wisdom. Because prior to salvation, as James said, we walked according to the wisdom of the world, which was unspiritual, it was earthly, and it was demonic. But at the moment of salvation, there is a sense in which we are initially, and I use that word, initially, we are given God's wisdom. Notice what it says here in Proverbs 1.7. We're all familiar with the Proverbs because it talks about wisdom. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You say, Mike, that's knowledge. No, it's wisdom because he defines what that knowledge is. Fools despise, here it is, wisdom and instruction. Now, when do you get the fear of the Lord? That happens at the moment of salvation because non-believers do not have a genuine fear of the Lord. More specifically, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, we see where you and I become wise at the moment of salvation when Paul says this, it is because of him, that is Christ, that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us, here it is, wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, our holiness, and redemption. You see, at the moment of salvation, in an initial sense, you and I now have the potential to walk in the wisdom of God. Why? Because wisdom, in a sense, to use another definition, is seeing things from God's perspective and then living out that perspective. And so, he says in 1 Corinthians that we're given that wisdom. How about Colossians chapter 2, verses 2 and 3? Paul here says to the Colossians, speaking of salvation, my goal is that 
they may be encouraged in heart, united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding. In other words, Paul wrote this letter because he wanted the Colossians to have the full riches of complete understanding. What did he want them to understand? Here it is. In order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, and notice verse 3, in whom are hidden all the treasures of what? Wisdom and knowledge. Now listen, if you know Christ and you're one with Christ, you have wisdom. See, non-believers do not have wisdom. Now, they may have wisdom in terms of having certain skills. There are atheists that are millionaires because they know how to invest their money. So there is a certain sense in which the world has secular worldly wisdom, but it's not spiritual wisdom because spiritual wisdom comes from above. And that's why only a Christian who's united to Christ, who has been regenerated by the Holy Spirit, who is born again at salvation, they're initially given the wisdom of God. Why? Because the tyranny of sin is broken in your life, and you now have God's perspective. And I think we would all agree with that. When you became saved, and there was a genuine transformation that took place, I'm not talking about a superficial commitment here. But when you committed to the Lord, I think all of us would admit here that our lives changed. We saw things differently. In fact, I read a great article this week. It's by a girl. You'll notice her picture up on the screen. Jackie Hill Perry is her name, and she came out with a book recently called Gay Girl, Good God. She's a hip-hop artist, so it caught my attention, and I decided to read it. And she basically grew up without a father. And at a young age, she struggled with her gender and that whole identity crisis that a lot of young people are struggling with today. She was addicted to marijuana, she said. She loved pornography. And she, has a, she had a lesbian girlfriend that she lived with. And she said her aunt raised her and took her to church up until she was 10 years old. And then here is what she says, and I quote, I had a basic understanding of the gospel growing up. Then in October 2008, I had an immediate and random awareness of my sin and its consequences. I just saw overwhelmingly that the consequences were not worth my life, were not worth my soul. I just saw Jesus rightly for the first time. There's wisdom. I repented and believed. And she says, I sincerely cared that God saw my heart and what was going on in it, end quote. And now she's on a mission to help young girls who are struggling with this idea of homosexuality and gender identity crisis. You see, you know what happened to her? She was given the wisdom of God the moment of salvation. God transformed her perspective. She was convicted of sin. But there's a sense in which wisdom is not just initially given to us at salvation, but it's something that must be pursued throughout our Christian life because we are to grow in wisdom and in knowledge. Listen to what Paul says in Colossians 1.9. He's praying for the Colossians, and he says, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. What did Paul pray for the Colossians? We continually ask God, here it is, to fill you with the knowledge of His will through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. Why would Paul need to pray for them to have more wisdom if they didn't need more wisdom? You see, we're given wisdom at salvation, but there's a sense in which we need to progress and grow in our understanding of wisdom because none of us arrive. We don't get to the point where we experience in to- total sanctification in this life. How about James 1.5, familiar passage to most of us. James says, if any of you lacks what? Wisdom. You see, if you lack wisdom, and we all do, that means we got to grow in wisdom. It's not just given to us at salvation. We got to pursue it the rest of our life. And he says, if you lack wisdom, don't hesitate to ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. You say, Mike, how do I grow in wisdom as a Christian? Well, listen, You grow in wisdom just by walking the Christian life. But you know how God produces wisdom in our life? Failure, brokenness, trials, testing, temptation, trial and error. All kinds of experiences in life 
produce wisdom in our life. Obviously, the main source of our wisdom is the Word of God. As we meditate and as we study the Word of God, we acquire wisdom so that we can say what Job 12, 12 says, great verse, wisdom is with aged men, with long life is understanding. Now, you and I know that's not always true. You and I have met people that have gotten older, and it seems they've become more ignorant as time goes by. But that should not be true for the Christian. You and I, as we grow in our walk with God and as we get older, we should see the manifestation of God's wisdom in our life, albeit we're not going to be perfect. Now, how can I walk practically in wisdom? Paul's going to give us three ways here in Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 15. Three ways that you and I can walk out that wisdom. We were given that wisdom at salvation, but how can I practically live it out? How can I acquire it? The first way is this. We must examine everything carefully. If you and I are going to walk in wisdom, Paul says we must examine everything carefully. And by the way, Paul's not giving us an exhaustive way on how to acquire wisdom here. He's just giving us a sampling. Examine everything carefully. Notice, if you will, verse 15. He says, therefore. Now, what's the therefore, therefore? Well, he talked earlier about walking in the light. And he says, therefore, if you're going to walk in the light and you're going to walk in truth and you're going to walk in holiness, he says, be careful. Circle that word. That word means examine everything carefully. He says, be careful how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Now, that word careful, the King James brings out the word circumspectly. You probably heard that word before. What does that word circumspect mean? Well, it's used of two words. You'll notice up on the screen, circum is used of a circle. We would get the word circumference from this. And then the word spec, we get the word spectacle. It means to see. It means to examine. And so, what does it mean to walk circumspectly? It means to see everything going around you and what's going on. Now, he's not being literal here. Now, I know we sometimes do that when we walk at night out of a store and we're walking in a big parking lot. What do we do as we walk outside? I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm looking around. Why? Because I want to make sure no one's going to thump me over the head and basically steal what's, what possessions I have. He's not talking about literally looking around and being circumspect like this. He's talking about it in a spiritual sense. And you know what he's saying here? We need to examine everything carefully. We need to be alert as to what is going on around us spiritually. Why? Because it says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, the devil prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to what? Devour. It means to be on guard. It means to be discerning. Now, we don't need to be paranoid as a Christian, but what it means is if you and I are going to walk wisely, we got to be alert as to what is going on in our circumstances, our relationships, and here's the reason why. We have to anticipate. Because it's like what God said to Cain. Sin is crouching at the door, and it wants you, and he says to Cain, unless you deal with it, it's going to devour you. And so we got to anticipate. That's what it means to walk wisely. You got to anticipate. There are some things in our life that on the surface don't appear to be sins. And maybe it's not a sin, but what can happen is if we're not alert, it can lead to sin. For example, you may start a relationship with somebody and you're married and it's a healthy relationship, a healthy friendship. But if you take certain steps, that can lead to an adulterous affair. And so you've got to walk circumspectly and go, here's the line that I'm not crossing. I was telling somebody the other day who has a problem or struggles with drinking. And I said, let me give you a scenario of what could happen here. You're on your job and you're doing really good. And you know, today they say a lot of people, when you work in the secular market out there, a lot of people are smoking pot. A lot of people are drinking. In fact, when I was up in New Jersey, I heard this all the time, the cooks and the chefs, and I don't want to say all of them are doing this, but a lot of them are on pills, they're smoking. You know, So it's just the melu in which we live. Everyone's doing that stuff. So you're trying to stay clean. You don't want to drink. You're walking circumspectly. And they say, hey, why don't you come? We're all going to go to the bar and have a drink. 
No, no, I can't do that. Come on, just hang out with us. Let's just have a drink. No, all right, I'll go and I'll sit with you, but I won't have a drink. And you know what? For the first three times, you don't have a drink. And then there's that day or that week that you have a bad week. You're discouraged. And they say, hey, come on out. And what happens? You take that one drink. You see how if you're not careful and you don't walk circumspectly, what it can do is it can lead you into sin. Billy Graham's a good example of this. Now, I realize Billy Graham was very high profile, and so he had to take extra measure. But Billy Graham, they said when he would travel, when he went into a hotel, he would have people go into the room before him and examine the room before he would actually go in. Because he didn't want a naked girl jumping out of a birthday cake and basically hugging him and somebody take a picture and now you have scandal even though Billy Graham didn't do anything wrong. You see, Billy Graham took extra caution, extra precautions because he wanted to walk circumspectly. And so we got to examine everything careful. Not everything appears to be what it is on the surface. In other words, as Christians, we got to go beyond the surface we got to examine everything carefully. we got to use discernment. What does it say in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5? Examine everything carefully. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. And you know what often trips all of us up? We don't take precaution. We're not careful with our associations, our friendships. We're not careful where we go, who we hang out with. This is true with people who date. I mean, I preach this all the time to single people. Do not go out with a non-Christian if you're a committed believer. Because what happens is it may lead you down that path. You say, well, is it a sin if I have one date with a non-believer? It's not a sin in and of itself if you're not engaging in immorality. But that's not the point. There are some things that are not necessarily sins that I have the liberty to do But if I struggle in certain areas, I have to say no because that is a pull for me. And listen, everyone here needs to know their bents and their pulls. You got to know what you struggle with. What one person struggles with, another person may not struggle with. And so if you and I are going to walk worthy and we're going to walk in wisdom, the first way is we must examine everything carefully. There's a second thing that we could do to walk in wisdom, and that is we must take advantage of opportunities to serve God. We must take advantage of opportunities to serve God. Notice, if you will, chapter 5, verse 16. He says, making the most of your time because the days are evil. Now, there's two Greek words for the word time. There's chronos and there's kairos. Chronos refers to clock time. And I know we often use this verse to talk about managing our time, good time management skills, and you can make a case from that theologically from the Bible, but this is not the verse to use because he doesn't use the word chronos. We get the word chronology from this. He's not using clock time, chronos. He's using the word for time, kairos. Kairos means seasons or opportunities. And what he's saying is if you're going to be a person of wisdom, Not only do you examine everything carefully, but secondly, you take advantage of the kairoses in life, the opportunities that God gives you because the days in which we're living are evil. Now you say, well, what are these opportunities? These opportunities are opportunities to serve God, opportunities to evangelize, to reach our family members. Some of you have been meaning to share with your family and you just haven't got around to it. You've been meaning to share with your coworker. Man, you've been meaning to up your tithe another 20 bucks. You've been meaning to serve in the children's ministry or get involved in the youth, or you're, you're meaning to go on that homeless outreach. You see, we all have good intentions, but you know what it says we do if we're walking wisely? We take advantage of the kairoses of life, the opportunities of life, because the days in which you and I are living are evil. And listen, we all want to take advantage. We all have squandered opportunities in our life. None of us are going to be perfect. But you know what? While we have freedom in this country to serve God, because you know what? People in North Korea do not have those opportunities. I was reading about a gal this week in North Korea. She eventually was able to get out of North Korea. But while she was there, she escaped to China. She became a Christian. 
And what happened was she got deported back to North Korea, and it was brutal for her. She was in solitary confinement for one year, and she said she did not see light for one year straight. She said she was basically in rags, and it was cold, and she said that whenever they would feed her, there was a little door that a dog would go out, you know, when they want to go outside. She had to crawl through that door. She had to be on all four, and she could not look up at the guards when they addressed her. She was treated like chattel and like an animal. You know what? In North Korea, they have limited opportunity, none to serve God. You and I live in a free country where we can worship God freely. We can go to Bible studies. We can serve people. We have the freedom to proclaim the gospel. And you know what? That opportunity is beginning to narrow in our country. It's beginning to close. Not completely. We still have a lot of freedoms. But listen, I'm convinced by the time my grandchildren get older, our freedoms in this country may be very, very narrow. And so here's the question. Are we going to take advantage of the opportunities? But you know what has numbed the American church? Comfort and materialism. You know what keeps us from taking advantage of opportunities? We're too comfortable. It's too hard to serve God. We're addicted to our comforts. Now, there's nothing wrong with comfort. I mean, I don't want to be in a house where there's no air condition. I don't want to be in the winter where there's no heat. There's nothing spiritual about saying, well, let me sweat this one out tonight and show my spirituality. No, but here's the problem. When my comfort keeps me from serving God, my comfort becomes an idol where I can't serve God and I can't take advantage of opportunities. See, that's when it becomes a problem. And so all of us need to not squander those opportunities. In fact, this week I looked up people that squandered their winnings from the lottery. And if you look it up, you will be surprised to see how many people, their lives were ruined and how they squandered all this money. Here's one, for example. William Post won $16.2 million in the Pennsylvania lottery in 1988, but he was $1 million in debt within a year. Here's what happened. A former girlfriend successfully sued him for a third of his winnings, and his brother was arrested for allegedly hiring a hitman to kill him in the hopes he'd inherit a share of the winnings. After sinking money into family businesses, Post sank into debt and spent time in jail for firing a gun over the head of a bill collector. Here is what he said, quote, I was much happier when I was broke. He lived quietly on $450 a month in food stamps until his death in 2006. And I can go story after story of people that had opportunity and they squandered it. And listen, how many Christians are squandering? They're spending their eternal retirement right now because they're not living for the eternal. They're living for now. And you know what they're doing? They're not investing in eternity. Now you say, well, why should I take advantages of opportunities to serve God? Well, he tells us right here, he says, because the days are what? The days are evil. We're living in evil days. It's dark. And you know what? Christians are called to shine the light of the gospel. We're called to be salt We're to retard the darkness. We're called to be leaven. In fact, good news, just now, about an hour ago, breaking news in Alabama, the governor passed a law that made abortion illegal. You cannot have an abortion in Alabama right now, not for rape or anything else. The only time they'll allow it is if the mother's life is in jeopardy. And now the ACLU has flipped out. You know what they're doing? They're taking advantage. We live in an evil day, and they're retarding the darkness. And so why take advantages of opportunities to serve God? Because, listen, we live in evil times, but we have the light of the gospel. We have the truth, and we are to sow the seeds of the gospel. Think about opportunities that you have to share Christ with people. I don't know about you, but I've squandered opportunities. I've had opportunities to share Christ. I've had opportunities, and the person died, and I've regretted that. And I'm not here to tell you that I have taken advantage of every opportunity, and I know John would admit the same thing. None of us do, but here's the question I'm asking you tonight. Could you be doing more? Could you be giving more? Could you be more intentional to take advantage of those opportunities? And I'll tell you what, another reason why we want to take advantage of opportunities, because listen, we get one life to live, 
And then we stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to be evaluated. God's going to evaluate what we do with our time, treasure, and talent. And listen, he's going to, he's going to reward us commensurate with our faithfulness here and now. We're not going to be evaluated for hell and condemnation because our sins have already been judged at the cross, but what the Bema seat is in 2 Corinthians 5 is God is going to evaluate our life. In fact, Noah, put that verse up there, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Look what he says here. For we must all, we must all, you cannot erase this from your day timer. You cannot delete this from your phone calendar. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And you know what's interesting? That word bad is not the word evil. You know what the word bad in the Greek is? Worthless. God's going to look at those things that we did that had eternal value, and there's a lot of things that weren't evil. They were just worthless. That's why I don't mow my lawn. It's worthless. No, I'm just kidding. No, you want to take care of your lawn, right? It's a good testimony to have a well-kept yard. You see, we're going to be evaluated. In fact, here's what we're going to be evaluated on. Show that tombstone, Noah. You'll see this first tomb. Your name, you know what God's going to evaluate? The hyphen in the middle. He's going to evaluate your hyphen and my hyphen. By the way, when I was looking this up, I found a couple of these that were funny. I thought I'd have to show them. Here lies John Yeast. Pardon me for not rising. Oh, that's terrible, isn't it? It's a real tombstone. I thought, that's great. How about this one right here? Good eating. This does not make me hungry. (laughs) But listen, God is going to evaluate our life. And so if you and I want to walk wisely, what's the first thing we must do? Examine everything what? Carefully. And the second thing we must do is we must what? Take advantage of opportunities to serve God. If you're not involved, I want to challenge you to get involved. It may not be Sunday morning. It may be calling people. It may be spending a lot of time in intercessory prayer. But listen, there's no reason why everyone in this room, unless you're physically incapacitated or you're hurting and maybe you need a break and you need some time to heal. God understands that. But there's no reason why everyone in this room should not be doing something for the Lord. And listen, we all have at least one person we could reach out to. So I want to challenge you. Take advantage. Don't be a lazy Christian. Well, there's one final reason this evening why or how you and I can walk wisely, and that is this. We must know and follow the will of God. We must know and follow the will of God. He says in verse 17, so then, sort of as a summary, if we're going to walk wisely, do not be foolish. Do not be a moron. Do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. You see, if you and I are going to walk in wisdom, we must know And not just know, but we must follow the will of God. And you got to remember, the churches at this time did not have all 27 books of the New Testament. And no one could pull out all their scrolls of the Old Testament. The rabbis didn't get up. The preachers didn't get up and say, all right, open your scroll to Deuteronomy. They didn't have access to that stuff. We have the totality of God's Word. And so what he's saying is, if you and I are going to be wise individuals as Christians... We got to know the will of God and we got to do the will of God because listen, if we don't, he says we're morons and we're fools. Now we know what Psalm 14 says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. So we know people that are atheists, the Bible calls them fools. But you know, Christians can walk foolishly if we don't know God's will and we don't follow God's will. Now, this is one of the biggest questions that people ask in the Christian life is how do I discover the will of God? Well, there's two components to God's will as we close this evening. Here's what they are on the screen. You'll notice them. There is the general will of God, and there's the customized will of God. What is the general will of God? That's what God has revealed in the Bible. That's his moral will. That's his revealed will. That's what we're to follow. So if you want to know what the will of God is for your life, you know where you need to start? with God's general will, with God's moral will, or his revealed will. Those three things mean the same thing. His general will as revealed in the Bible. A lot of people want God's customized will. God, who do I marry? 
Lord, what job should I take? Lord, what should I do in this situation? Should I move from this city to this city? They want to know the customized will, but they want to ignore the general will. It doesn't work that way. So when Paul says, if you don't want to be foolish and you want to be wise, he says, know the will of God and do it. You say, Mike, how do I know what the will of God is? How do I know how to do it? Get into the Bible and obey the Bible. Properly interpret the Bible using proper biblical interpretation skills, and then apply the Bible to your life. You're not going to do it perfectly, but that's how you know the general will of God for your life. And so here's the point. If you and I are not studying the Bible, we're not meditating on the Bible, the only Bible we're getting is Sunday morning or Wednesday night, which, by the way, is better than nothing. It's good. But if we're not in the Word ourselves, we're, in a sense, going to walk foolishly. If you want to be a wise person, meditate on the Word of God and apply it to your life. And then, if you want to understand the will of God in terms of a customized sense, here's my view on this biblically. Ask the Lord, guide me, Lord, in this situation. If it doesn't violate God's word, his revealed will, then you're free to do it, as long as it's not illegal, immoral, or immoral, unethical, or against the Bible. In other words, if I'm obeying God's revealed will as in the Bible, and I'm walking in the Spirit... As I face decisions in life, you know what I do? I pray about it, and I say, God, what do you want me to do in this situation? And unless God gives me a clear word on that, you know what I do? I say, all right, Lord, I'm going to walk through this door. If it's not your will, close the door. Because here's what I assume. If I'm walking in the Spirit, God's going to what? Going to lead me. When I took the church in New Jersey, we prayed about it. I checked with Laura. I checked with my daughters, and I said, is everybody feel comfortable with the relocation of the Northeast? They said, yeah, we like the area, we like the church. So I called the board and I said, hey, we're in. He said, oh, you didn't fast and pray? There's a place for fasting and praying, but I knew it was God's will. And you know what? The fruit of it ended up being God's will. And listen, while we were in New Jersey, Laura and I were going through a particularly sensitive situation, a difficult situation. And I said, Lord, we need to move from the Northeast. And I said, is it your will that we move? Well, guess who called me a day later? Pastor John. Out of the blue. And John said, hey, Mike, what are the chances of bringing you here to help me teach? And I said, it's interesting you bring that up. And then two or three days later, I told him what was going on. And you see how God worked the circumstances out. And he opened doors. Sometimes God reveals his customized will with open and closed doors Sometimes he gives you desires. He puts those desires in your heart, and he says, this is the way, walk you in it. Sometimes God will use a prophetic word. He could use a vision, a dream. There's a lot of different ways God reveals his customized will. But the bottom line is, if I'm not obeying his general will, forget about his customized will. God wants you to start there. So if you're living in sexual immorality, you're living with your boyfriend, your girlfriend, you're sleeping together, it's no big deal, you're a Christian, listen, clean up that area. You're not going to be perfect. We all are going to fail, but we've got to walk in God's revealed will. And so he says, if we're going to walk wisely, we got to know the will of God and then do the will of God. And so how do you walk worthy? You walk in unity. You walk in service. You walk in separation. You walk in love. You walk in the light. And you walk in wisdom. How do you walk in wisdom? There's three ways. Number one, examine everything what? Carefully. Number two, take advantage of opportunities to serve God. And number three, know and do the will of God. That's how you could be a wise person. Now, next week, we're going to look at the seventh way that we can walk worthy, and that is we need to walk in the Spirit. He's going to go into that, and we'll look at that next time. Let's pray. Father, thank you this evening for teaching us clearly from your word and showing us how we can walk worthy before you. Father, we humble ourselves and acknowledge that we need you to live this worthy walk. We cannot live it as we're going to see next week apart from the Holy Spirit. And so we need to be filled with the Spirit. 